today we are at the last part of the Thessalonians. So let's all stand up as I read Second Thessalonians chapter three in New Living Translation. The reason I read New Living Translation is it's a modern language, so we can listen better. But when I give a message, you'll be mostly on New American Standard, or some of them are NIV. Okay, so let me read. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes, just as when it came to you. Pray, too, that you will be rescued from wicked and evil people, for not everyone is a believer. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And you, we are confident in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we recommended you. May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding and expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away from all believers who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition they received from us. For you know that you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, when we never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night. So when we would not be a burden to any of you, we certainly had the right to ask you to feed us, but we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. Take a note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. Stay away from them so that they will be ashamed. Don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or sister. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. Here is my greeting in my own hands, Paul. I do this in all my letters to prove they are from me. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please sit down. Father, we continue to uh, pray for Thailand. Pray that indeed that Jeremy and Christina will be uplifted, encouraged from uh, how you use each one of them, the mission team. Lord, I pray that what they speak, how they uh, carry on your message, uh, Lord, I pray that it will just shine your truth to those people who are still living in dark. And Lord, also I pray for the congregation that you would open their eyes and their ears, their hearts and their minds to your message. And Lord, I pray especially for me that I will speak all the things that you have uh, taught us, taught me to speak today. Father, after all, this is your word and not mine. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I titled this last chapter of Second Thessalonians as a call to the purpose-driven life or a call to gospel-centered life. 
This chapter is an exhortation, pleading for Christians to live out their faith. Paul is urging all of us Christians to move forward, embracing new life. The new life which Christ has paid for your sin with his blood. Therefore, now that you are the child of God, by his precious blood of Christ, so live as one. You are no longer in darkness, but in the light. You live in a total ignorance. You lived in a total ignorance and blinded, but now you are blessed for the, of the understanding of God, and you can experience the goodness of him as who he is. So take off your sinful life, or fleshly life, that is, or following your desires of this flesh, but put on new, pure, holy, godly life, which Christ has given to you through his sacrifice on the cross. You became a new creation, as is in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. New things. There are three new virtues that you received when you became born again Christian. Some of you may be confused on this word born again. This implies that your relationship with God is now reconciled. You are no longer hostile to God, but rather you become a precious child to Him. When you repent your sins, and surrender your life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So what are these three virtues? These are faith, hope, and love. Indeed, these new virtues have been placed in you, and they continually grow in your lives, your new lives, as you abide to the teachings of Christ. Do you see these three Christian virtues growing in your life daily? These will grow if you follow the command of Jesus Christ. Today, however, I will not talk about these three virtues. Instead, I will preach about the new things that are more external and tangible for the world to see that you can recognize yourself. Wow, I am different. This is a new trait that I got. Of course, there are several things that are new that came, and I'm continually discovering as I'm continually growing old and following Christ. Some of the three traits that I want to just bring it out through the text that are unique to us, the new creation. So I want to point that out. So what are they? Here are the three things. Uh, first, thank you. Being confident in the faithful yet invisible God. In verse three to four. Number two, faithfully working what you are created to be. Six through fifteen. That is the purpose-driven life that I wanted to talk to you about in the second point. And then the third, keeping peace in every circumstances all the time. Verse 16 through 18. So first, from verse 1 through 5. Here Paul makes several requests for Christians to pray for the ministry and for the perseverance of faith of fellow believers. Paul is encouraging Christians to pray for the rapid expansion of the gospel message, the good news, the power of God, the salvation for all people, for all nations, for the entire creation. Today, this morning, we were going through some of the things and in the Bible study. This creation is not only talking about just us. 
whole new creation, this power of God, the saving gospel message, by the way, is all those, not just us, beyond us, visible, invisible, sun and moon, everything, all the living things, all his creation. This is a good news. That's why Paul tells you in chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, talks about even the whole creation moans and groans to anxiously longing, waiting for the sons of God to appear. The glory. That's what this is about, right? New life. So then Paul here in the text urges them to make supplication for the workers, the message bearers, the missionaries, the ministers. Then they will be rescued from all opposition that goes against the expansion of the gospel message. Then Paul says this in verse 3 and 4. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We will... We have confidence in the Lord concerning you that you are do, you doing and will continually do what we commanded. Now, this is what Paul is saying. The Lord your God is faithful and that he will protect you so that you will be able to continue to do what he has given you to do. So let's back up a minute. We know that Paul had to flee from the mob who were jealous for the gospel success in Thessalonica. So Paul escaped to Berea, which is about 50 miles southwest from Thessalonica. By fast walking, that would be about 10 hours away, right? If you do five miles per hour walking, that's pretty fast. Because usually when I walk fast, it's four miles per hour. So I calculated about 10 hours. But then he again had to get away from the mob who pursued Paul all the way from Thessalonica. So the mobs, they even came down and tried to even interrupt what Paul's doing in Berea. It was that kind of situation. Opposition of evil men? Oh, yeah. Paul experienced it. So Paul traveled to Athens, Athens, which is about 150 miles further south from Berea. Now, that's at least a three to four day journey if you do a fast walk, right? And he did it alone. Because we know from the Acts, he actually went in alone to Athens and then had this uh, wonderful experience spreading gospel message, right? See, Paul was chased, beaten, and stoned by evil men in numerous accounts, right? Well, this hardship is well-known events to all Thessalonian Christians. Yet, here Paul is reminding them that God is faithful and thus will strengthen and protect these uh, Thessalonian Christians from the evil one. Here he states that he is confident that God will enable them to continue worship and expand gospel message in Thessalonica in spite of the threats from the mob, the evil men. Do you believe that God will remove all obstacles that interferes them to live out their gospel-centered life? That is wiping out all evil men around the church? No, of course not. That's not what Paul is saying here. He's stating that God will protect them and deliver them from the hands of evil men. That he is confident on. Do you remember Isaiah chapter 41? It's not in the Bible verse, but 41, 1 through 2 or something like that, that God knew us before we were born. And God called us by name at our birth. And God claimed us as his. And so when we walk, when we pass through the waters, he will be with us. When we uh, 
path, uh, the path through the rivers, it will not overflow us. When we walk through the fire, it will not scorch us, nor its flame will burn us. Like what here we're talking about. It's not that God's going to remove fires, remove waters. But as we're going through, God's going to be there with us and he's going to help us. He's going to help us to grow. He's going to help us to transform us into like Christ. That's these traits will shine as we follow through these things. That's what Paul is talking about here. That's why he says this. He says, as it is written in Philippians 1.6, For I am confident, for I am confident that he who, oh, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of the Lord. He is who? Our God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All Trinity, they are working together to bring us, perfecting us until Christ comes. That Paul is confident of. That's what he's saying here. So God will protect us and protect us, the very outcome of the well-being of Christians. This confidence stems from faith. In the word of God. Whatever God intended, it will be fulfilled. Nothing he says will go waste. Likewise, when he used his church to deliver this wonderful soul-saving gospel message, then no matter what, the church will deliver them. If not in their lifetime, then from generations after them. Until all of them, all of that God desires to come to him. This will go on. Because God will fulfill everything he intended. This is the word of the Lord as is written Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. As the rain and the snow comes down from heaven, And do not return to it without watering the water and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seeds for the sowers and bread for the eaters. Likewise, so is my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire. And achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is the word of the Lord. That he will do what he said that he will do. And he said. God will fulfill every word that he spoke. This new confidence is more of a dispositional trait of us. It sets Christians apart from the world. He says you apart from the world. Will the world understand this confidence? How could they? They don't know God. So the world will laugh at you and tell you that you are foolish. They will say all day long, where is your God? You cannot feel or touch or feel him. He doesn't exist. So how could you have confidence? Not only the world tells you, but also at times, even deep inside, your wandering thoughts, a thought might creep up and challenge your disposition. However it might be, we are new creation. This is a new trait that we have So, with the confidence in the faith of God, we embrace such hardship of life with joy. With joy. Let me tell you about a great prophet named Jeremiah. 
who showed his confidence in the faithful Lord. Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, cries out in his grief, foreseeing the inevitable destruction of Judah. Yet his grief is not about why, Lord, or shouting for help to remove such calamity, but rather his shout is about this. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases. For his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. This is lamentation. This is when this is about the sadness of all the sorrows he's experiencing. Yet in chapter 3, this, he shouts out this praise. And he shows his confidence that they are new every morning. His faithfulness is fresh. And then he shouts out, great is his faithfulness. Jeremiah, known as a weeping prophet, shouts this wonderful confidence in the faithful God in the midst of all utterly helpless situation. What is this dispositional trait which will be impossible for the mind of unbelievers to comprehend? Isn't a normal person should exhibit panic and frustration and anger, questioning God as to why he would let such calamity of destruction fall upon his chosen people? The city of God, the holy God, where the most, holy, most high dwells. Now, this city is being attacked by the hands of ungodly, ruthless heathens. But instead of he's reacting as what is normally, worldly reaction, yet here in Jeremiah, on the contrary to what the world might expect him to respond, he praises God. And acknowledging God as who he is, he is confident in the faithful God. That God will not let his people lose heart and grow weary. He will sustain them. He will strengthen them. He will help them. He will be with them as they go through the river, as they go through the fire. Because God, Emmanuel, is with. Paul reminds us we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, by the way, when we became a Christian. Right? First, is it second, two, second Corinthians 5, uh, 3.16 or something like that? It says, do you not know that you are a temple of God in that the Spirit of God dwells in you? It's a constant reminder for us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit is with us. Whatever we do, wherever we go, we are, he is with us. So that's why as far as Paul even telling us that we are, don't grieve the Holy Spirit that is in us. He reminds us that, right? And also at times when we do not know how to pray, the Spirit with a deep groaning, too much for the words. He intercedes for us in prayer because we do not know how to pray. Great is thy faithfulness. If anyone I should name, I named Jeremiah, who showed his confidence in the faithful God who will deliver his children from evil. This is the same confidence that you have now that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God that is in you illuminates and teaches us this very confidence as you live out your life following Christ. As a disciple of Christ, as you follow, comply to his teachings, you will experience 
and be more solidified on this confidence. Second point, faithfully working what you are created to be. Verse 6 through 15. Now, this is the main purpose that I wanted to talk about, the purpose-driven life that I titled uh, today's sermon. It is perseverance. It is self-control. More of a fruit of spirit that is listed in Galatians. The trait is a new thing that yielded in your Christian life. This sets you apart from the world because... You see the world as what purpose God created it to be. Your new trait, the faithfulness, will grow under the lordship of Christ as you fulfill the purpose of your God, of God in your life. As you all learned from past several months, the Thessalonians church was confused about the second coming of Christ. Apparently, this confusion was there even when Paul was teaching and preaching at Thessalonica. Because if you look at verse 10, it talks about that, you know, even when I told you while I was there, no work, don't eat. On verse 10, remember that one? So it was there. But he had to say it again. Why? Because some of them still hard-headed like some of us here, including me, uh, they all just continue living the way they want to live and did not listen to Paul. They were too excited and highly consumed by the thought of end of the world. Maybe they thought it literally to stay awake and wait for the return of the Lord. Maybe some of them sold all their belongings and lived around the church. But this misunderstanding has had a terrible consequences. They became troublemakers in the church. Paul commanded them that they should separate from the fellowship, but not as an enemy, but as a brothers. They ought to, right? Why? Why did Paul give you the, gave, gave that commandment? Command. In the name of the Lord. I mean, that is a pretty strong word that he said in verse 6. Why did he do that? It is because they became a bad influence. Bad influence. An obstacle. They became lazy and meddling in the business of fellow Christians. Rather than being encourager, they became discourager. Their behavior became burden. Taking away resources. Well, this morning we talked about the giver and taker. Well, they are the takers. And uh, they became disorderly and disruptive. They refused to work for themselves. They are living off from goodness of others. Bottom line, they are wasting away what God had called them to live a call the purpose driven life they lost their purpose so Paul rebuked them as such that don't eat unless you are unable to work of course there are people that who cannot work period then of course we need to help as a church as a body of believers we got to help the needy, those who cannot help themselves. But those who are able to work and yet they don't work, Paul is saying, don't help them. Don't let them even eat off your table. If you can work, then work. If no work, then you have no right to eat. It is so easy to fall into temptation of live off of others, if the help comes freely and discreetly so that there is no shame involved. Even if you can take care of yourself, you'd rather get the aid from, especially government, if it is free. 
here is some of my worldly inclination. I thought of, okay, the fleshly, me. What, what kind of inclination do I have? So this is what I kind of wrote. He says, in flesh, I'm lazy. My sinful nature wants to take shortcuts, an easy way out. I want to get away and not doing any hard work if I was given a choice of not doing it. If someone or entity gives me free things of life so that I don't need to work for it, then why should I work? And if I receive them continuously, then without a doubt, I'll come to depend on it. Then as time goes, my thankfulness will become normal expectancy of receiving it. So I will start complaining and show anger if it is not given to me freely. If someone takes what I think is due to me, then I will stand up against the person and try to take it from him. I will take hostile action against him if it needs to be because I believe that I'm entitled to receive it. I stress the word entitled because there are some of the words that we hear in the media about entitlement, entitlement. But anyhow, so, so I refuse to earn it. Why would I sweat and suffer to earn it when it can be received freely? That's what I just described about sinful nature of me towards hard work. The corrupted image of God that what I became born with. Look around. The world is full of such people who I just described. We know it is wrong, but we rationalize it and then we live in it as if it is a justified action. The purpose-driven life or purpose-driven life regarding work However, we'll change that for you. We'll help you to overcome such undesirable trait. You see, our purpose is to glorify God. That's our purpose. We are created in Christ Jesus to glorify God. To do good work that is set aside for us to do. That's what we are. When we do that, then we will be satisfied. The more you glorify the God, the more satisfaction you will have. Why? Because we are fulfilling what we are created to be. That's why. Because that's how we are created. So we'll be happy and satisfied if we follow what we are created to be. Yes, work is hard work. It requires sweats and challenges. It demands you to be exposed to so much stresses. If you do not weed your garden and it will grow on its own for only a season, then what happens to your garden? The weed will choke all plants. Your garden will no longer look desirable, right? What happens if you don't clean this worship place? And every, every Sunday we come and worship, but just don't clean, don't. Do any work. Will you want to come back here a year later? I mean, a year later, you'll still want to come and worship in this disorderly, dirty place? Of course not, right? Is cleaning easy? Well, we don't know because we hire someone else to do it. But if you have to do it by yourself, it is not easy. Vacuuming and picking up and cleaning up takes time, energy, right? What about weeding the garden? Is it easy? It's hard, especially when it's hot like this right now. <laughs> it is hard, sweaty. The reality is the work is hard. That's the reality. I remember staying up all night worrying about work in my early 30s. I used to shout out short sentences in my sleep. All job stress related. When I was in business, I used to work 80 hours a week. I felt like I was riding a wild tiger running on its own. 
and I had no control. It was a scary feeling to be in. So I can tell you without a single thread of contradiction in my heart that the work is hard. If you think otherwise, please see me later because I want to learn your secret. Let me tell you about the absolute unwavering fact. The work requires your sweat and your resources. Here, Apostle Paul commands in the name of the Christ, Jesus, as a stern warning to those who refuse to work. Then he directs the reader's attention to his example and his teaching. See, day and night, Paul worked making tents and earned monies. And with it, he paid food and lodging. And then on non-other working times, he was busy teaching preaching the new way of life in Christ Jesus. That was Paul. He said, look, look to me, look, use me as your example of what you should be and listen to the teachings, the traditions that I told you. Focus on those. But then he states this explosive word in verse 10. Even when we are with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. No work, no food. Pretty clear. We can trace this command all the way back to the book of Genesis. Because Adam wants to be like God, so he went up against the will of God. And thus he willfully broke the only law that was given to him. As a consequence of this deadly sin, God cursed the ground. And he said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, this is what he said. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you are taken for your dust and to dust you shall return. The beginning of our hard work and our death because because of consequences of sin. Because God cursed the ground, the work became hard. And we are still living under that same curse. That's why it is hard. But we ought to work. But before the curse of God... Work did not require sweats, intensive labor, so much stresses. Rather, work was good for us. Work was good. When God created the world, he, it was good. He blessed it. He made man in his own image and said to him in this verse 1 through 28, he said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then on chapter 2, verse 19, we can see Adam working. Out of the ground of the Lord, God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. You see, Adam is categorizing and naming all living creatures. This is work which God has given to him to do before the work became hard. Work was pleasure because all the physical necessities are met by trees, fruit of the trees, by the ground, the grass, the yields. Food was abundant to eat. He doesn't need to work. There was no work related. The temperature is perfect. That you would not need any clothes, as we know, that they were naked. The ground was so pleasant that he could sit and lie down. 
when they go to sleep. The lions and cows would graze in the field together. There's no more killing, no more fighting. But they are eating a living in perfect harmony. All the creatures. God created man and woman to live forever. Continue to multiply. There is no disease, no sickness, no sorrow, no grief, no failure, no war, no greed, no pride, no calamity, no death. Nothing is decaying or turning into unruly or disorderly or disruptive. All perfect and beautiful, living under the shadow of the wings of our Creator God. That is what the world was created. But it all changed because of a sin. So the work we know it was not hard, but became hard because of sin. Even though it is hard, we must not. Stop working. We must continue work overcoming hardship that comes with it. It is the way we are created to be. God created us to do his work, right? No. Not for his work. We are created to do the work for our well-being. Do you know that God also works for our well-being, even now as I speak? There are numerous references in the Bible that says God is working on our behalf. Here are some uh, references. Philippians 1.6. Paul is addressing to the church of Philippi, saying that, For I am confident that he who began a Good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. He is confident that God is going to continue and will perfect. And the same message that came from Jude 24 and 25. He says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you blameless in the presence of God with a great joy. Again, we see Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit working together to help us to not to stumble and to present us, to stand in the presence of Holy God, blameless with a great joy. God is working continuously to bring us, to conform to His Son's image, transferring us. As we follow Him, same thing. Through that, we will become like Christ. That's how we fulfill the purpose for which God has intended us to be, a purpose-driven life. What are the things that God gave us to do? Everything. Cleaning the house, weeding garden, driving, eating, washing dishes, serving others, well, cooking meals too, by the way, witnessing, praying, paying taxes, and on and on. These are some of the things that just came to my mind. I wrote, but, you know, whatever, right? Whatever God brings to you in your horizon to work, those are what you are responsible for. Don't continually pray, say, what is God's will for me now? No, God's will for you to be responsible, accountable for everything that comes to you. And through which, when you are obedient, faithful, that he will transform you to become like Christ. That you will go deeper in faith, deeper in hope, and deeper in love. Your confidence in the midst of your calamities, but you will rise and shine to the faithful God you declare in that confidence that people don't know. The world can understand, but we do. We have the confidence in the word of God, the promise of God. That's what we are. New thing. The old thing passed away. 
Now, new things have come, one of the confidence, and our work ethic, perseverance, steadfastness, and stick, continually going and working diligently. Small things, big things, doesn't matter. Whatever that comes to us, we do it as we glorify God. Paul commend all Christians in 1 Corinthians 10.31. This is what he said. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all, do everything for the glory of God. In everything what you are doing, we honor God through our thoughts and actions. Do you know that after this life, even life eternal will be working. It may be shocking to you, but yes, you better believe it. The work is privilege, a pleasure, and rewarding. We will be the judge of fallen angels as it is written in the book of Hebrew. There it goes, our new job title of afterlife, working as a judge. And in Revelation 22.3, it says, There will be no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants, that is us, will serve him. Here we go. Our new job title in heaven, Server for the Lord. Yes, we'll be serving Jesus Christ in whatever capacity he puts us to be in charge with. Jesus told a parable to his disciples in Matthew about a faithful servant. This is what he said. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share the joy of your master. You see, because you did job well, I'm going to reward you with even more jobs. Sounds burden or burdensome to those who think job is a burden. But in reality, when the curse is lifted, because work is good as God has placed on his beauty, in his wonderful creation, the more goodness will be when we engage in more work. Now, that is how we see things, because we are. But we have to overcome these hardships by steadfastness, by perseverance, by faithfulness. Be accountable for what God has entrusted with. Then you will experience this goodness of work. No longer the work is tainted by our sin and under the curse of God. When that happens, right? So now, in this present age, while even though we are living under the curse, even though work is hard, let's not try to take shortcuts and avoid the work. Embrace it, knowing that work is good, knowing that God is the one that he's entrusting these work with. Overcome the difficult part by your steadfastness. We are created to do it for our own good. So press on, my brothers, my sisters. This is your new deposition. This is how your orientation, your inclination towards the work as a new creation, as a new being in Christ Jesus. Now, last trait that world can see, which sets apart, it is the keeping peace in every circumstances all the time. When you learn to rest in God under his mighty hand, 
You can find peace continuously, whenever and wherever. Like drawing water from the well that never runs dry. You have surrendered your life under the Lordship of Christ. So why are you still trying to run your own life and ignoring the Lordship of Christ? This battle will continue forever until you surrender. You see, you became a Christian because you repented and surrendered your life to Christ. But then after you have become a Christian, then you're slowly taking back your control and trying to live your own life. So don't do that because the battle will continue until you give up, until you learn to know, to surrender the Lordship of Christ and be faithful, accountable, be responsible on the works. And Learn to rest. Learn to rest in God under his mighty hand. Learn to go to Christ in everything for all your circumstances. Then you will find rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight 20 through 30, it says this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take this yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am, what? Gentle, humble, gentle and humble in heart. And you will find a rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ, go to Christ and learn to find a rest. Your struggles, whatever you're overcoming, you are a new created being now. Your new creature, the old thing has passed away. New old, behold, new things have come. One of the new thing is now you can go to Christ. You can rest in Him. And you will find what? Peace. We should run to Christ all the time. After Jesus told his disciples that he will leave them behind and go to Father in heaven, this is what he said. This is said this. Peace I live with you. Peace I give to you. Not as the world give, but peace. This is brand new peace. This is the peace that just the world cannot understand. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it fearful. It's the peace that comes from the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is called Prince of Peace. This is the peace the world cannot understand. This is the peace that I can share with fellow Christians in time of trouble and hard times. But it is a peace that I cannot share with those who are of the world. But we are not of the world. We are of God. We have the spirit of Christ in us. Through the Spirit of Christ, we can access the bottomless peace that continuously flow out from the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you rest in God, you will find peace. It is a peace which Christ gave to us to access anytime, anywhere. In addition, we'll experience peace when we pray. I want to share this last verse, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, with supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It's illogical, but we have a peace after we pray, after we Get all, whatever the warning thoughts, whatever that is, we let that known to God. We'll guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7. Remember that. It is that peace surpasses all understanding. So find peace always. For this is a new thing that came to you when you accepted Jesus Christ 
as your Lord and Savior. So let me restate the three new things I preach today in summary. First, joy exhibiting confidence in the time of trouble. Second, perseverance and steadfastness in daily responsibilities of life, although life is tough and unbearable. And lastly, unquenching peace or unquenchable peace that sustains us no matter what and when and wherever we are. May these three wonderful traits continue to solidify and deeply rooted in your newfound life in Christ as you follow Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Let's pray. Father, I praise you for the goodness, the mercy, the grace that you have given us through Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Father, for instantly, instantly, <laughs> instilling all these wonderful traits for us to be and the work that you have assigned us to do. Father, I, burp, I pray for the blessing of this congregation that they will be challenged, encouraged, and motivated to continue living this wonderful, victorious, purpose-driven life. Father, I pray that uh, you will work through our uh, wonderful traits and shine it in such a way that the world will see us as the light and salt spreading gospel messages everywhere to all those who need to hear. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.